Question Zohal, l'honorable chef de l'opposition. The honorable leader of the opposition. Mr. President, after... Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this prime minister, he's not worth the cost of housing, which doubled since he took power. The middle class in Ontario, a couple sold their house to buy a castle in France, a 6,000 foot castle on 37 acres. They said they couldn't sell that castle to buy a house in Ontario. Why is it more expensive to be a member of the middle class in Canada than an aristocrat in France? The Honourable Minister. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question. There's one thing the Leader of the Opposition can do, just one, to help Canadians. It's to vote for our Affordability Act. We want to reform competitiveness, but we want to get rid of GST for building new housing. For once, finally. Will the opposition vote for Canadians? Yes or no? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. After eight years, this Prime Minister isn't worth the cost, and another law isn't going to change that. Yesterday, Conservatives raised a question with the Minister of the Environment. We asked if yes or no, the Department had warned this government that its so-called regulations on fossil fuels was going to disproportionately increase costs for people with lower incomes? And the answer is yes. The Bloc wants to increase this regulatory tax. Will this government finally overturn this tax so that Canadians can buy food and housing? No, no, the Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to remind uh, the opposition leader that in their campaign platform for 2021, they proposed setting up uh, standards for clean energy. The difference between us and them is that they just talk about it, whereas we're acting on it. Thanks to the standards in place, th thousands or rather millions are being invested all over the country to help Canadians reduce their carbon footprint when they use their cars. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. We know that, this, that after eight years, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost of housing, which has doubled since he took office. It's gotten so crazy that the cost of a house in Ontario means that one couple sold their 2,000 square foot home in that province and was able to buy a 6,000 square foot castle on 37 acres of land in France. They now say they could never sell the castle and afford to move back to Canada. Why does it cost more to be a member of the middle class in Canada than to be a, an aristocrat in France? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Minister. Mr. Speaker, we will take no lessons from the Conservatives. Conservative, Mr. Speaker. There is one thing, Mr. Speaker, not many are agree, but there is one thing that the leader of the opposition can do for Canadians watching at home. Mr. Speaker, is to vote for the affordability bill, Mr. Speaker, that will empower more competition in this country, that will reduce GST in new housing, Mr. Speaker. Will once for all, will they vote for Canadian? Yes or no? The Honourable Leader of the Opposite. None of the bills are affordable after eight years of this government. I, I, ask, I ask, why is it that you can buy a castle in France for a lower cost than a middle class home in Ontario? And his response was basically, let them eat cake, yeah. Mr. Speaker. The yeah. fact is, people can't even afford bread after eight years of inflationary policies. Will they reverse their inflationary deficits and reverse their tax hikes so Canadians can eat, heat, and house themselves? Yeah. 
Donahad Minist. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, the Leader of the Opposition refuses to explain to Canadians why he won't support legislation that is going to make housing more affordable, that's going to build more rental units for Canadians, that's going to make groceries more affordable. Mr. Speaker, it has been clear that for the past eight years that they've been in opposition, they haven't done anything to support Canadians. What we do know is that they've constantly voted against measures that support Canadians like childcare, like the Canada Child Benefit, and like this legislation that they have an opportunity to do the right thing and to vote for Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. They've been promising for eight years that their bills would lower the cost, but since that time, housing costs have doubled. They promised their carbon tax would make people better off, then they brought in a second carbon tax. And we uh, asked the, the government's own officials at committee yesterday if their analysis showed that the cost would rise for energy and that these costs would be borne disproportionately by the poor and middle class, and that government official confirmed that yes. Why is this government taxing the people who can least afford it? Will they admit that after eight years they're simply not worth the cost? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. According to a study that came out two days ago, in Canada, 60% of small and medium-sized business across the country have been affected by extreme weather event this year alone. 44% of them say that they've, it has a hit, a direct hit on their revenue. What's the response from the Conservative Party? Let's make pollution free again. Let's have more climate change. Let's, ha let's have more air pollution and water pollution. I think Canadians can take any of the, propo the proposition that the Conservative Party of Canada has for them, Mr. Speaker. Bravo. Bravo. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. This is day 13 of the war between Israel and Hamas. Humanitarian needs are more acute than ever. The United States pledged $100 million in humanitarian aid. Canada pledged too little. But even more important than money, aid has to be able to reach the civilians who desperately need it. As we speak, only 20 trucks have permission to enter Gaza. According to the United Nations, at least 100 are needed per day. We're far from that gold. Has the Prime Minister spoken to Israel and Egypt to ask for better access to provide humanitarian aid? The Honourable Minister of Global Affairs. In fact, the Prime Minister spoke with the Israeli President and the Egyptian President. We have constantly asked for access to provide humanitarian aid to Gaza. Gaza is one of the most difficult places to live right now on the planet. It's important to get aid into Gaza. We're going to continue to engage with different countries in the region for that to get done. There's one thing that Canada can do on the world stage, and that's show humanitarian leadership. I know it's a lot to ask of Egypt in terms of opening its border to Hamas-occupied territory. I know it's a lot to ask of Israel when Hamas is holding 203 hostages, but humanity can only come from them. It can't come from the monsters behind Hamas. Humanitarian aid has to reach civilians. What's the Prime Minister doing to make sure that it gets done quickly. The Honourable Minister for International Development. The current humanitarian situation is deeply concerning for our government. Civilians are the first victims of this tragedy. Canada's commitment to provide humanitarian aid remains unshakable. Getting aid to civilians is essential. We implore all parties to protect civilians and to, in all circumstances, maintain their commitments towards upholding international humanitarian law. Toronto's housing crisis is out of control, worsened by the loss of thousands of affordable homes by both Conservative and Liberal governments. Asylum seekers were left homeless this summer while the City of Toronto had to carry the weight of housing them. This federal government promised 
$97 million in assistance, but Toronto hasn't received it yet. Why are all the Toronto Liberal MPs so ineffective and unable to convince their own Prime Minister to deliver Toronto the help they need? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I've had the opportunity to speak to Mayor Chow to address the interim needs, obviously, with winter coming to make sure people have a roof over their heads. It's work we need to do with the Ontario government, with the City of Toronto, with the GTA generally, because we know that asylum seekers are being spread out into all those areas, and they need to have a roof over their head for, 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 for winter. But clearly, what we need to see from the City of Toronto is the actual receipts. We've asked Mayor Chow for the receipts. We're glad, we're glad, we're glad to pay for those receipts once we receive them. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Then I have deputy to Burnaby Sud. The honourable member for Burnaby South. To try that answer on someone who has to live on the streets. That's right. Yeah. The story of Jeanette Chasson. Jeanette Chasson, 76 years old, evicted, forced to find a smaller apartment, less well adapted and more expensive. That's unacceptable. That's the result of the Conservatives and Liberals who have failed to inv get more affordable housing available. What does this government have to say to the thousands of people like her? The Honourable Minister. I thank my colleague for his question. One thing he could do to help Canadians, one thing, and that's a vote for the Affordability Act. Why? Because not only will that change how competition runs in the country, it will remove GST for new housing builds. I implore the opposition, all members of this House, to vote in favour of Canadians, because Canadians really need it. Then I have Deputy de Calgary, Forest Lawn. After eight long years of this Liberal NDP government doubling the national debt, doubling mortgage and rental costs, Canadians could also see a 40% increase in their monthly mortgage costs. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. 85% of variable rate mortgage holders believe they are worse off. Liberal inflation, fueled, liberal fueled by Liberal deficits, made the most rapid interest rate hikes ever. And now Canada is most at risk in the G7 for a mortgage default crisis. When will the Prime Minister rein his inflationary spending and so interest rates can come down and Canadians can keep a roof over their heads. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As you know, Mr. Speaker, Canada has the lowest deficit among all G7 countries. Canada has been reaffirmed as AAA credit rating because our fiscal uh, frame is responsible. But, Mr. Speaker, we continue to support Canadians, and the Conservatives continue to call for cuts. You see, Canadian families are relying on the supports that we provide, are relying on the Canada Child Benefit, are relying on their pensions, Mr. Speaker, and the Conservatives' plan is to cut all of those supports to Canadians who need them. That's right. Then I have the Calgary Forest Lawn. Responsible. This finance minister can't even drive responsibly, and they want us to believe that she's fiscally responsible. Many Canadians are uncomfortably close to broke, according to an MNP survey, with more than 50% of Canadians $200 away from insolvency. After eight years of failed Liberal policies, they're just not worth the cost. There's young Canadians and fixed senior incomes living in their cars and under bridges in tents. That's the state of Canada after eight years of their failed policies. Will this Prime Minister balance the budget get inflation and interest rates down so more Canadians don't have to live out on the streets. Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, I've been a member of Parliament since 2015. From day one, that side has pursued an austerity agenda. Canada Child Benefit, they want to cut it. Supports for seniors, they've never been there. Supports for businesses during the pandemic and since, they've never been there. We brought down taxes for small businesses not once but twice. They opposed it every single time, Mr. Speaker. We're helping cities with public transit, with other infrastructure. They are not there. They're not worth the risk, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a survey released this morning by financial firm Edward Jones Canada said Canadians are stuck in a chaotic whirlwind of personal financial stress. The poll clearly shows that Canadians are preoccupied with just getting through the day. 
and that the idea of paying debt feels like a distant dream. Wow. It found 88% of Canadians saying their personal financial situation is affecting their well-being. This Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. When will the Prime Minister stop his inflationary spending so people can take back control of their lives? Good question. L'Honorable Secretary Parlementaire. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I invite the member opposite to, to listen to some of the testimony from experts at this morning's Finance Committee who refute those statements. But, Mr. Speaker, I would like to get back to the legislation that is before this chamber, because the Conservatives have an opportunity to help stabilize grocery prices across this country. That is legislation that they can vote on, Mr. Speaker, right now in order to support Canadians. It also includes a measure to help stimulate the construction of more homes across this country, Mr. Speaker. Another way Way the Conservatives can actually help Canadians. Here, here. Right then I have the Kelowna Lake Country. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's been eight years, and what the Liberal member opposite is saying does not match the facts. The Liberal deficit spending has increased inflation, which has increased interest rates. Right. A resident from my community said food prices have risen so quickly that she's been left to praying that her garden will be enough to supplement their household of four teenagers. You know, I used to hear from residents saying that they were hoping that they could save for a home one day, and now I'm hearing from residents saying that they're praying for a bountiful harvest to feed their family. This Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. When will the NDP Liberal government end their inflationary spending so people can feed their families? Here, here. <laughs> not the Honourable Minister. Speaker, uh, I'd like to thank our colleague for the question. I mean, we all feel for what she said, Mr. Speaker, but instead of having words, why don't we talk about action, uh, Mr. Speaker? There is one thing, there is one thing that the opposition can do, Mr. Speaker. Not many, I agree, but there is one thing. They can vote for the affordability bill. If she really cares about the lady that she refers, why don't she convince her caucus to vote for the affordability bill so they can do something once for Canadians? The Honourable Member for Megantic Lérable. After eight years of inflationary liberal deficits, cost of living is going up everywhere, but it's worse in Quebec. Nearly 5% inflation. That's the highest in Canada. Everything costs more. Interest rates going up. Young people are losing their dreams of owning a home. And you know what? The Bloc Québécois isn't helping either. They want to radically increase the carbon tax. It's expensive to vote for the bloc. Will the Liberal government admit that it's time to stop taxing Canadians and Quebecers more? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to remind my honourable colleague that Quebec was the first to set up its own cap-and-trade system for carbon more than a decade ago, well before the federal government did it, well before uh, the provinces did it. If my colleague has trouble understanding that system, I'd be happy to explain to him how Quebec's system is unique in Canada and one of the first in North America. The Honourable Member from Mégantic-Lérard. You know what Quebecers understand? They understand that when they go to the grocery store and they pay 23% more for food than three years ago, they know, they understand, they see that the carbon tax has a direct impact on how that food is transported, how it's produced. They see the effect of the Liberal Bloc tax that they want to increase when it's time for them to pay for food at the grocery store. More and more Quebecers are going to food banks, and they are middle-class Quebecers. Are they not ashamed of this, or are they just going to keep taxing them? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleague from mégantic Clarem for the question. But for all the people in mégantic Clarem watching us now, there's one thing their representative can do. It's to convince Conservative MPs to vote for the Affordability Act. And why? Because we're going to change competition. We're going to give more power to the Competition Bureau. We're going to focus on practices that don't help consumers 
I want him to do his job and convince his colleagues to vote for this once and for all. The Honorable Member for Joliet. Yesterday, the government votes st voted against a simple request, which was a plan to come back to balance books. We're not asking for the moon. We're not asking to cut services to balance the books. We're just asking for a plan. Everyone knows the start of the saying from Émile de Girardin, to govern is to plan ahead. But he added that not planning ahead puts you on the road to ruin. The liberals are running fast, like gazelles. All we want is a plan. Is that really too much to ask? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague from the Bloc Québécois, who sits on the Finance Committee, for his work on that committee. I would answer that our deficit is the lowest among G7 countries, but 0.7% of our GDP is involved in that debt. It's very low. Our fall economic update is coming. The Minister of Finance will reveal everything to Canadians at that time. The Honourable Member for Mirabel. Not only do they not have a plan for the future, but new ministers don't have any mandate letters. Ministers appointed in July don't have their letters. And months later, they still don't know how to orient their work. The there's talk about a new minister for the Treasury Board, the one who holds the purse strings, and she still doesn't have a mandate letter. Public services, defense, transport, justice, official languages, the list goes on. When is the prime minister going to give them their mandates? The Honourable Minister. I would like to thank my honourable colleague for his question. The mandate letters have not changed for the new ministers. So all the ministers know exactly what they need to do. And those letters are public. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, there's a human cost to governing on autopilot. The Auditor General confirmed that more than half of immigrant applications for permanent residents are being processed late. For refugees, there's almost a three-year wait. It can even stretch out to four years for spousal sponsorships. The federal government, in the meantime, is raising its immigration thre thresholds, even though it's unable to serve the people it's supposed to be welcoming now. These are people. Will the federal government stop treating immigrants like numbers? The Honourable Minister. Une très bonne question, Monsieur le Président. A very good question, Mr. Speaker. What I would like to highlight is the Auditor General emphasized that a great deal of progress has been made. That's what we expect from the public service. There's been progress made between the date of the report and now, and that's what I expect. For refugees, we obviously need to do better. And when it comes to the digital transition, we're going to be making announcements in November. Thank you. Then I have Deputy Dufferin Calden. After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, Canadians are literally in housing hell. A Canadian couple with a 6,300 square foot mansion in France on 37 acres, if they sold it, they can't afford to move back to Fergus, Ontario. Wow. This NDP Liberal government is not worth the cost. And yet every day they stand up, puff up their chest to tell Canadians what a great job they've done. Why don't they stop gaslighting? Canadians and admit they've broken housing in Canada. Then I have Secretary Parlementaire. Mr. Speaker, if we're going to tackle the housing crisis, we have to work together and pursue agendas that are serious. This government has put forward a number of measures, for example, lifting GSD on purpose built rentals, period. That side is proposing a tax on the building of middle class rentals. Shameful. Rentals for middle class individuals and families, that construction would be taxed by that side. They also don't want to work with municipalities. We put $4 billion on the table for that. They want to cut all of that. Shameful. We need to build more. We will build more on this side, not with that approach. Yeah. Then I have Deputy Dufferin. 
the Honourable Member for Dufferin Caledon. The housing crisis is we should support more of their failed policies. That's their answer, Mr. Speaker. It's a special kind of incompetence. If you don't have a house, you can't afford it. If you have a house, you can't afford to keep it because interest rates are so high from their inflationary deficits, Mr. Speaker. And yet they keep spending and spending and spending, and interest rates go up and up and up, and Canadians are at risk of losing their homes. Will they get these inflationary deficits under control so Canadians actually don't lose their home? Yeah. 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 The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Reminders, it's no problem. When they were in office, and that leader now, that opposition leader was the so-called Minister of Housing, If I could ask the member from Dufferin Caledon, who had just asked a question, to please let the Parliamentary Secretary respond to his question. From the top, the Honourable, the, uh, Honourable Sec Parliamentary Secretary. As I was saying, they need reminders, Mr. Speaker. The Harper government had put $300 million towards housing. You know how many homes were built, Mr. Speaker? Less than 100. Oh, wow. At a time when it's clear that the lack of supply has created an increase, a, a vast increase in the cost of rent, this government is moving forward to build more, to help the private sector do exactly that. That side, as I just said, wants to tax the construction of rentals for the middle class. Shame. On top of that, they don't want to work with municipalities to get the results we need. It's not a serious agenda. It's a reckless agenda on the other side. Yeah. The Honourable Member from King Vaughan. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, this Liberal NDP government blew $1.5 billion on bureaucracy and the homeless crisis has never been worse. Mm -hmm. A quarter of the homeless are seniors, and this is only an estimate. The real number is much higher. With ballooning interest rates, rising food costs and the housing crisis, this Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. When will this Prime Minister start caring about monetary policies so seniors can, that built our country are not left out on the street? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have made significant progress to help seniors since 2015. And these efforts have reduced poverty for seniors over 65. The facts are the GIS increase helped lift 45,000 seniors out of poverty. Restoring the age of retirement back to 65 prevented 100,000 seniors from falling into severe poverty, against the wishes of the other side, I should say. And these benefits are automatically adjusted to keep up with the cost of living, and they will never go down. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First Nations for decades have screamed about the deplorable conditions they live in. Statistics Canada now confirms that this Liberal government failed to make any progress since 2016. Under the Liberals, Indigenous peoples have no choice but to live in unsafe, overcrowded and mold-infested homes. The four billion over seven years towards urban, rural, northern housing is not enough. When will the Liberals act so that Indigenous peoples have safe homes to live in? Mr. Speaker, since 2015, we've worked with First Nations partners to address the shocking and appalling housing gap that exists on First Nations. And indeed, over 33,000 units of housing have been built or renovated since that time, Mr. Speaker. And we continue to invest in affordable housing, not just for First Nations people, but certainly for Indigenous people in urban, rural, northern communities. Mr. Speaker, compare that to the record of the Leader of Opposition. For $350 million, 99 houses built. We can do better as a country, Mr. Speaker, and that's what we're doing. Suncor is raking in billions in profits, yet their corporate rap sheet is a long list of disturbing allegations. Environmental damage, workers killed on the job, price fixing at the pump. But the blockbuster lawsuit in the state of Colorado is new. The Colorado indictment is clear. Suncor, quote, knowingly and substantially contributed wow. to the climate crisis through intentional 
reckless oh. and negligent conduct. My friends, this is the big tobacco moment for Suncor. So what will this minister do to hold this company to a court and make sure that they reduce emissions to protect our children's future? Lanahad Minist. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I share the concern of my honourable colleague the leader of an important company like Suncor should be working with us to help fight climate change in a time where we're seeing record heat, record floodings all around the world, including in this country, record forest fires, record hurricanes. We need everyone to step up to the plate. We know it won't be the Conservative Party, but we're counting on all the leaders in this country, except the Conservative Party, to work with us to ensure that Canada does its fair share when it comes to fighting climate change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Northern communities already face higher costs of goods like food and fuel than Canadians in the South. And with high inflation, these costs are building even more. Our government, though, is taking action to support the middle class and those working hard to join it. This week, our government announced new measures to reduce costly banking fees for Canadians. Can the President of the Treasury Board Please tell us, this, this House, how these new measures will help make life more affordable for Northerners and Canadians alike. Good question. Lanahab Minist. Mr. Speaker, unlike the Conservatives, we are taking a responsible and balanced approach to fiscal management. Just this week, we announced new measures to ensure Canadians are treated fairly by their banks. These measures include protecting Canadians from rising mortgage payments, enhancing low-cost banking options, lowering non-sufficient fund NSF feeds, ensuring that Canadians have an impartial advocate when they have complaints complaints against their banks. Mr. Speaker, today and every day is a great day to fight for Canadians, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Deputy the Foothills. It's this simple. Higher taxes on farmers, on truckers, on processors means higher food costs for Canadians. Canadian farmers will pay close, pay close to a billion dollars in carbon taxes alone by 2030. After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, this Prime Minister isn't worth the cost. But Conservatives are bringing forward common sense solution, like legislation that will exempt the carbon tax from on-farm fuels like natural gas and propane. But the Liberals are trying to kill this bill at the Senate, despite all party support here in the House and in the Senate. Why is this Prime Minister fighting so hard to make sure that food and farming remains unaffordable? Good question. Minister, Minister, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind uh, all members uh, that until they're recognized by the chair, that the microphones won't go on. The Honourable Minister. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate my honourable uh, uh, colleague's question, but I think he fully understands that we, the climate Farmers fully depend on what happens in the climate. When in Prince Edward Island we had a hurricane Fiona, it blew warehouses down, it blew dairy barns down, it killed cattle. And Western Canada, which my honourable colleague is from, straw is worth three hundred dollars a bale. In the prairies, it burnt, it burnt, and, and they had floods. Quite simply, Mr. Speaker, if we do not deal with the climate, we will not ever do anything about the price of food or. Or, or be able to help farmers. We will continue to address the climate issue in this country. Then I, then I have deputy the foothills. Well, ironically, the Liberals set aside $300 million to ACOA for, to deal with Fiona for farmers, but not a single dime has gone out the door. But all parties in this House supported this legislation. Even the Greens understand how important, how important farming is. Wow. 
after eight years of higher interest rates and inflationary costs, and now not one but two carbon taxes, this Prime Minister is simply not worth the cost. The Prime Minister is fanning the flames of inflation with yet another carbon tax on Canadian farmers. Right. Why will this Prime Minister not respect the will of this House and axe his farm-killing carbon tax? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my honourable colleague is correct. Fiona did incredible damage, and I'm proud that, uh, um, as the minister responsible for a call of the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency, we did receive $300 million. $100 million of that has gone to Small Craft Harbours. There was $40 million that has gone to uh, Parks Canada. We now have a program on the table that is offering funding to build climate centres. I think there's $9 million left in the fund. I'd be glad to give the honourable member details. I'll get back to him on that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I could just remind members, please, to uh, restrict your comments to the time that you actually have the floor to ask, either ask a question or to answer a question. The Honourable Member from uh, Dauphin Swan River, Nipawa. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Canadians can't afford to drive their cars or heat their homes. But that doesn't matter to this NDP Liberal government. After forcing Canadians to pay costly carbon tax, they are plowing ahead with a second carbon tax. Earlier this week, the Minister's Department told the Environment Committee the Liberals knew that their clean fuel regulations would cost Canadians more. Will this government finally admit that their second carbon tax is not worth the cost? Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Jill lives in the writing of the member from Regina Capel. She recently shared that she gets more money back than she pays out, and it helps her at the grocery store. Mr. Speaker, she doesn't want the carbon pricing rebate to go away. Why would Conservative Party of Canada cut this program from Jill, Mr. Speaker? to get letters. <laughs> the, the Honourable Member from Dauphin, Swan River, Nipawa. Mr. Speaker, these are the words from the government's own impact assessment on their clean fuel regulations. Quote, the regulations are estimated to increase the price of gasoline and diesel. Quote, low-income households may be disproportionately affected by regulations. Quote, rural Canadians may have limited opportunity to reduce their fuel consumption in response to higher fuel prices. Why did the government ignore their own advice and plow ahead with a second carbon tax? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If the Conservatives have a problem with my accent in English, I'll answer in French. A professor wrote that he had just received his rebate, and this year he'll get $720, so that's over $13 a week. Bob says he's getting more money back thanks to this rebate, and he's calling on us and the Conservative Party uh, to keep this rebate alive. The Honourable Member for Abitibi-Timiskaming. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Finally, Canada is making a name for itself on the international stage. 
Canada has just been nominated for the Anti Noble Purpose Award by the by a Connecticut university for its refusal to hold a public inquiry into sexual misconduct in sports. The federal government has been promising such an inquiry for over a year. The Liberals even had time to swap out the Minister of Sports, but they didn't have time to launch the inquiry to ensure the safety of athletes, especially women. It was already a disgrace, and now, with this award, it's an international disgrace. When will the government launch a public inquiry? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague, my Honourable Colleague, for that question and for his work on this very important issue. It is crucial to proceed with systematic reforms to the culture of sports. Our sports system it involves our children, and uh, we expect leaders and coaches and so on to be accountable. A lot of work has been done, and there's still more underway. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Abbott Tibby Timiskaming. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's always the same with the Liberals. They make announcements when they feel the heat, and then they drop the ball. It's been a year since the former Minister of Sports promised a public inquiry into sexual misconduct in sports. After a year of inaction, the Prime Minister didn't find fault with her. He promoted her. Mr. Speaker, Canada could have been a world leader in the fight against sexual misconduct in sports like it has been in fighting doping. Instead, Canada gets nominated for an ignoble award. Mr. Speaker, when is this government going to get to work for the victims? Not, not had. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And once again, I'd like to thank my colleague for the question. We have undertaken the work to create a safe sports framework in Canada. We're taking steps around uh, sporting safety, including the Office of the Sp uh, Sports Integrity Ombudsman and also to make it easier for victims to report abuse. Canada is a leader, Mr. Speaker, in making uh, Canada's sporting system safer. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of Liberal government, everything is more expensive. And the Liberal government, with the enthusiastic support of the bloc, has invented and implemented a second carbon tax. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, a vote for the block will cost you. And now the department admits it hasn't even assessed the impact by region. So transit uh, is an example. Can the block explain why they agree with this second carbon tax? The Honourable Minister, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd be pleased to explain to my Honourable colleague that Quebec does not have a carbon tax. They use a cap-and-trade system. And the standard for clean fuels that we implemented was one of the Conservative commitments in the 2021 election campaign. The difference is they only talk about it, whereas we here on this side, we do things. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, I'd be happy to explain to the Minister that the first Liberal carbon tax does have impacts in Quebec because things bought from outside Quebec are affected by the carbon tax. And there's not that much transit in uh, regions versus Montreal, but the, the fact is that Quebecers are going to have to pay the second carbon tax when it comes to transit. How does the government explain that to people? The Honourable Minister, 
Mr. Speaker, I have a lot of respect for my honorable colleague from Louis Saint Laurent and uh, for all the viewers from that riding. But the people in La Tuc expect one thing. They expect the member for Louis Saint Laurent to be, he, they know that he is a reasonable man, that he speaks on behalf of the Conservative caucus. He's an influential man. So I'm sure that he will convince his colleagues once and for all, to vote for Canadians and to support our affordability legislation. That's the best way to help Canadians. Order, colleagues. The Honourable Member for Lévis, Lodbinière. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal government, they go and introduce a second carbon tax without even assessing regional impacts. With the help of the Bloc Québécois, who want to radically increase this carbon tax, voting with the government twice, the Bloc isn't thinking about Quebecers who are struggling to make ends meet. A vote for the Bloc will cost you at the grocery store, at the pumps, and when you're looking for a roof to put over your head. Mr. Speaker, this Liberal government is washed up. So why is the bloc supporting the costly carbon tax that's hurting Canadians and Quebecers? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question, but what's hurting is the interpreter's ears, Mr. Speaker. What he doesn't understand is that uh, Canadians watching us in Lévis and other places, people are watching and they're wondering, will the Conservatives for once, for once in their lives, vote in favour of Canadians and helping them out with affordability? Because on this side of the House, it's clear. Will they, for once in their lives, vote for Canadians, yes or no? The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Louis. Mr. Speaker, as we all know, Canada is in the midst of a housing crisis and our government is hard at work to resolve it. We've put forward Bill C 56 to kickstart new housing projects by eliminating the GST. But as we speak, the bill is still being debated in the House and the help for Canadians all across the country is getting held up. Can the Minister of Employment and Workforce Development tell the House how this bill will help Canadians who are hard hit by the housing crisis? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for Lac Saint Louis for his question. Bill C 56 will accelerate housing construction all across the country and create quality jobs. And we know that investing in housing construction reduces inequalities, Mr. Speaker, and helps build strong communities. But once again, the Conservatives are filibustering and refusing to support this bill. They're against social development and against housing construction, or are they just caught up in their own political games and they can't see that Canadians need help? My question is, will they help Canadians, yes or no? Then I have Deputy to Wellington Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, Canada's closest intelligence allies have already clarified the record. This government has not. 
So I'm going to give the government an opportunity to correct and clarify the record. Will the government clearly state that the Israel Defence Forces and the State of Israel were not responsible for the explosion at the hospital in Gaza on Tuesday? Mr. Speaker, what happened in Gaza is absolutely devastating. Palestinian civilians, Israeli civilians are equal and must be protected. You've heard the Prime Minister earlier today. Canada and its allies are working to determine exactly what happened, and Canadians deserve answers. Then I have deputy the Cypress Grass, Cypress Hills Grasslands. Well, Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Prime Minister, Canada has lost its reputation as a world leader in energy production. After telling Germany, Japan, and France that there's no business case for LNG, Qatar is now the supplier of choice for our G7 allies. This is the same Qatar that is housing the leadership of Hamas, the terrorist organization that is murdering innocent Israelis and Palestinians. Will the Prime Minister admit that there is not only a business case for LNG, but a moral one as well? Mr. Speaker, it's just shameful to be drawing that type of a conspiracy theory when we're talking about such sensitive issues. But let's talk about how we are actually supporting our allies, because the facts are important. We are actually working with all of our allies in providing green hydrogen, in providing nuclear technologies. We are there to support our allies when they come looking to us for support. And I would ask the member opposite, if he cares so much about clean energy, why did he vote against supporting the creation of wind, offshore wind, in our Atlantic provinces? It creates good paying jobs and clean energy. Good job. Deputy, Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. At least $38 million of a $1 billion green slush fund is under investigation for conflicts of interest and gross mismanagement. It's a, another example of corruption and scandal, and Canadians want to know who got rich. After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, we have whistleblowers who are seeking career and legal protection for bringing Canadians' attention to this latest example of government waste and abuse. This Prime Minister is simply not worth the cost. So Canadians want to know which BFF or family member or former staffer or Liberal lobbyist got rich. Yeah. <laughs> Speaker, uh, again, uh, we need to rectify the facts, Mr. Speaker. I think there will be a number of small and medium-sized businesses in the country, in the energy space and the environmental space, which will be shocked by this comment, Mr. Speaker. What we did, we did the responsible thing. The moment we had delegation of wrongdoing, Mr. Speaker, we hired an independent third-party expert to investigate. Once we got the result of the investigation, Mr. Speaker, we took action, Mr. Speaker, and we demanded from that agency, like we would demand from all agencies of the Government of Canada, to have the highest standard of governance. That's what Canadian expected. That's what we did, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this week is Small Business Week. Small businesses employ about 10 million Canadians and contribute about 40 percent of the GDP. From indigenous people to new Canadians, we have a dynamic entrepreneurs in my riding of Nipian with small businesses in technology to tourism sectors. I am glad our government has supported these local businesses. This is week is an opportunity to celebrate them. Could the minister responsible for the Federal Economic Development Agency for Ontario tell the House how we are supporting our hardworking small business owners and entrepreneurs across Canada? Let have been asked. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Small businesses are the heart of Canadian communities, and our government is delighted to support small businesses like Madoaki Farm, which I had the pleasure of visiting with the member from Nepean. 
They offer a unique Indigenous experience and a marketplace for local Indigenous entrepreneurs. Our government is going to continue to support entrepreneurs and small business owners so they can reach their potential and develop new possibilities for Canadians. Thank you to all our small businesses across Canada for your commitment, for your dedication and hard work. Happy Small Business Week. Madame Député de Skeena, Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, on Tuesday, several water main breaks saw torrents of water pouring down the streets of Prince Rupert and flooding people's homes. Now there's a citywide boil water advisory, and this isn't the first time. Last December, the city had to declare a state of emergency due to its failing water infrastructure. So will the, th this is a port city, Mr. Speaker, that is critical to Canada's supply chain and our economy. Will the minister stand and speak directly to the people of Prince Rupert and assure them that timely federal help is on its way? Here, here. Of course, the member understands that all questions and answers should be directed through the chair, the honourable parliamentary secretary. I'd like to thank the honourable member for the question, an important question at that. We know the people of Prince Rupert are facing serious water challenges and we're closely monitoring the situation. Through the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund, we're helping communities protect their critical infrastructure while reducing long-term costs associated with replacing infrastructure following natural disasters. The Minister has been working with Mayor Pond as well as the province on Prince Rupert's application through the fund to address its water challenges. We will always have the backs of the people of Prince Rupert and we'll share more on this as soon as we can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. L'Honorable Député de Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, through the height of the pandemic, small businesses in my community, from Big Bliss Yoga to Full Circle Foods, did all we asked of them. Now, during Small Business Week, they need more than a selfie. They need time to ensure before what they thought was a grant will get turned into another loan they'll have to repay, and 18 days previously announced isn't good enough. If this government's got $30 billion for a pipeline that's only going to accelerate their own extinction, will they not step up for small uh, uh, businesses when they need it the most? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We understand the struggles that many small business owners had during the pandemic and that many continue to face. That is why we are offered additional flexibilities for small business to repay their SIBA loans. This includes a full one-year extension on the term loan repayment deadline, more flexibility on refinancing, and more time, Mr. Speaker, to access the loan forgiveness, which is both a balanced and a fiscally, a fiscally responsible approach. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Et ça met fin à la période des questions orales. Euh, je comprends qu'il y a un appel au règlement. L'honorable député de euh, la pointe de l'île. The Honourable Member for La Pointe-de-Lille, rising on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, 